as we embark together and explore. Good morning, one and all, for gracing us with your presence. Reva Business School was established with a long-term vision to educate and empower the next generation of managers and leaders to build sustainable business, which will not only enable them to achieve operational excellence, but also explore new business models. With a highly trained faculty and an enabled management, Reva Business School provides its students a great learning environment that fosters intellectual, social, and ethical development, and that enables them to pursue successful and fulfilling careers. We believe today's lecture, which will be delivered by our distinguished Doyen, will help students develop holistically. The Numbi Effect, a forward-looking for young Indians. Embracing your passions and allowing them to serve as your guiding light is a transformative journey that leads to a life infused with purpose and fulfillment. In this pursuit, it becomes imperative to hold on to truth and integrity, the unwavering pillars that sustain the authenticity of one's endeavors. Just as shadows only serve to highlight the brilliance of a flame, challenges are not obstacles, but opportunities to rise above and illuminate the strength within. Setbacks, far from being defeats, are chances to refine the resilience that lies within the core of a person. When navigating the intricate tapestry of life with this mindset, every trial becomes a stepping stone towards personal growth and self-discovery, and the pursuit of passions transforms into a radiant path towards a more meaningful existence. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome today's guest, Sri Nambi Narayanan S. We welcome you, sir. I also like I also like to welcome our honorable chancellor Dr P Shamaraju who has been a com continued pillar of strength to our school we welcome you sir We welcome Dr M Dhanam Jaya vice chancellor Riva University for his continuous motivation welcome sir I also extend my welcome to the pro vice chancellor for academics, governance, training and placement, and the Dean of Reva Business School, Dr. Shubhai. I welcome you, ma'am. I also welcome all the dignitaries present, teaching and non-teaching staff of RBS and our dear students. Sri Nambi Narayanan S. needs no introduction at all, but it is my privilege to read his profile. Sir was the former Director of Advanced Technology and Planning at ISRO headquarters bringing a wealth of experience with a distinguished 35-year career in the management of liquid propulsion systems and launch vehicles. As a project director, he played a pivotal role in realizing the second and fourth liquid stages of PSLV, showcasing unprecedented efficiency and complexity for Indian launch vehicle program. Widely recognized for his persuasive and resolute leadership, Sir boasts a proven track record of successfully managing challenging space missions with exceptional throughput. His expertise spans a diverse range of launch vehicle technologies with notable contributions, including fathering the liquid propulsion technology in India and serving as the project director for cryogenic systems project. The Vikas liquid propulsion system, a major contribution of his, has been integral to the success of PSLV and GSLV rockets, including landmark missions like Mangalyan and Chandrayaan. Nambi sir's illustrious career includes close collaborations with the legends in the field of rocketry, such as Sri APG Abdul Kalam, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, Professor Satish Dhawan, Dr. Brahma Prakash, and Professor U. R. Rao. Having joined ISRO in the year 1966 and retiring in the year 2001, he contributed immensely to the growth of ISRO over a span of 35 years from its inception. Sir's so educational background is equally impressive having graduated mechanical engineering from Madras University in the year 1965 and obtaining a postgraduate degree in science from Princeton University, USA, specializing in chemical rocket propulsion under the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical. His enduring legacy is marked by his multifaceted contributions, unwavering dedication, and pivotal role in shaping India's space exploration landscape. So it is a great honor to have you among us today. Now, to felicitate our guest, I request Honorable Chancellor, 
vice chancellor and our dean to accompany the guest on stage Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Now, now, I would like to hand over the session to you, sir. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of young faces, it takes me to at least 50, 60 years back uh, when I was a student like you. And I am seeing the chancellor, vice chancellors, pro-chancellors, and professors, students. I think it's a mix of uh, engineering students and management. I'm really delighted to, to visit uh, this institution. I should thank particularly Mr. Raghendra, Raghendra Rao Shetty, who did a continuous uh, follow-up. It was my laziness with which I was not really willing to move out of my native place, uh, but then I, I made up my mind and uh, I am with you today. I, <laughs> I asked them what is that I should speak here. I really don't have an agenda and I, I, I scribbled something and it is in my pocket. And, um, so what I propose, this is a proposal, is that I can share uh, some selected incidents which uh, came in my life, uh, particularly in the uh, Indian Space Research Organization. Those incidents uh, may be, according to me, are important and uh, you have a press here, okay. <laughs> and they are not uh, reported earlier in some occasions. Not because it is something confidential, but because it could uh, cause some embarrassment to some uh, people. But I'm just, uh, I'll try to avoid the names as far as possible. 
So these incidents uh, could be used particularly by the engineering students as well as more by the management students. Um, <coughs> how I reacted in those incidents and how you would react in a similar situation. So, but first of all, let me tell uh, some brief background of, um, so I closely worked with uh, Dr. Kalam, Dr. Pram Prakash, Professor Sad Sadish Davan, Dr. Sarabhai, and you are Rao. I was lucky, I should say. When I joined ISRO, I, we were only 23 people, totally, including the driver. So with the 23 people, with the chairman coming quite often, we had the opportunity to move closely with the chairman. And um, that, that way, we were lucky in the sense that the uh, chairman knows you by name, and you, you were a little, uh, apparently, bold enough to talk to the chairman, for example. But in ISRO, the culture is slightly different. Uh, you can call the chairman in a meeting, even today, with such a large uh, crowd. You can say, Mr. Chairman, I hope you, I think you are wrong, uh, which we, many, many institutions will not digest uh, this kind of a statement. But in ISRO, it is allowed, permitted, and nobody takes uh, them in the bad taste. So that way, we started our career. So I was lucky to have that kind of a situation. So briefly, when I applied for uh, a job in ISRO, at that time, it was not ISRO. It was known as uh, Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station, shortly known as TERLS, T-E-R-L-S. And I was having a job with Kalam on the payload integration. That is, the we had two rockets imported. One is called the Nike Apache, another one is called Sender. So we have to integrate the payload with the rocket, and as it flies, we. So as I I was having a job of integrating this. Honestly, I did not know what this payload does in the high altitude. They will say electron density. They will say wind velocity. I, I honestly I was not aware, but I was aware that this payload should go in such and such a manner, in uh, such and such a way it has to perform. So we had a lot of uh, fun, a lot of experiences during those days. I will take one or two incidents during that talk, which I am going to have. Uh, but if I want to write, you can write volumes of books on those uh, interesting episodes, including a scientist climbing up the coconut tree to pluck tender coconuts, or uh, you know, those kind of experiences. So in, in, the, in the process, I will also just, for the sake of completeness, when I was looking for a job, I saw this advertisement in Tumba, that is the TELS. So actually, my earlier assignment was with the sugar factory, and I fought with the chief engineer. In fact, I, as a young person, I was very short-tempered and uh, immature, I should say. But whatever way you take it, even a small thing can tickle me, and then I will. So in fact, on a fight, similar fight with the chief engineer, I just resigned my job, came back. My mother was not well. I took care of her. Then I was looking for a job. When this job I was looking for, this tells, the last date was on the same day when I saw the paper, 18th of June, evening. So I went there, still with no hope. But I asked the administration, they said, yesterday it was over, so you can't apply for that today. And straight away, I asked uh, whether I can see the director. They told me, yes, he is there. We had only three buildings there. One is a church building. It's a old church. And another one is a bishop house, where the bishop used to live. Now we have, he has vacated, so the director was staying there as his office. And there was a school building, more or less like attached shed where we used it as an experimental laboratory. So I went to the director, H.J.S. Murthy, a fine gentleman, 
straight away. I told him that yesterday was the last date. It is over, and I am here to apply for that. Can I apply? Then he said, if it is over, then how can you apply? I, I just thought of an excuse, saying that if somebody from Madras or Bangalore is applying, you will get the application only tomorrow or day after. So why not you consider that I am coming into that category? And probably that old man was impressed by that. So he said, all right, you apply. They said, next <laughs> bombshell. I said, I won't be able to produce any experience certificate because I fought with my previous employer. <laughs> so then he said, any other thing you have? Any other thing? I said, nothing. These are the two facts. So I applied, got the job. and. Uh, but before that, I was interested in knowing whether this organization also could be something like my old organization. So I want to make sure that there is no hangi pangi. So I was looking around, and then somebody said that if you go to Indra Bhavan, there is a building. There are some people who are working in Turles are there. You can go and talk to them. So I went there. There was one Aravamudan. He's shortly known as Dan, D-H-E-I-N, Aravamudan. Cut shot, Dan. I asked Dan. Dan showed me his hand to another person, a short person, and then said, go and talk to him. He knows about the organization better than anyone else. So I went and talked to him. He said, what, what for you are asking? I said, I am applying. You are applying? Then you just apply, and then don't talk to me on this matter anymore. I told him that I am not asking for any recommendation from you. I just wanted to know what is the kind of organization. I just wanted to make sure that it suits me. He didn't uh, talk to me very openly. I came back and I asked Dan, what is the name of this person? Then this person is known as Kalam. That is how I met Mr. Kalam, my first meeting with him. Later, we were sharing the same table. And uh, so many lovely experiments were there. And um, I will just touch upon one of the incidents as a payload integrator. Could, I, I should also say a little bit more about it, because otherwise you won't be able to appreciate the problem behind it. This was uh, an experiment which is known as uh, 4501. The number of the flight is 4501. The 4501 had so many payloads which includes an accelerometer developed by Ramakrishna uh, and an ejection mechanism developed by Kalam and uh, a probe developed by Dr. Satyaprakash and a transponder developed by Dr. Kalla, etc. So this rocket carries all this payload. This payload, as it, after it reaches the altitude, the nose cone should get ejected followed by the probe coming out. And the probe is expected to measure the wind velocity and then electron density, et cetera. And there is an accelerometer, which otherwise will start receiving signals and then working on it. And then there is a transponder, which will receive signals and then send back, et cetera. So this was the experiment in brief. Because my voice happened to be good within inverted gamma, I was also doing not only payload integration, but also that of a controller's job. Uh, the controller is nobody other than a person sitting in the blockhouse. The blockhouse is an area where you really control the entire operation. That is, you are a figurehead. Everybody should talk only through you. For example, a payload integrator will say payload integration, calling controller. The controller will say, go ahead. Then he will say whatever is his problem. It will be heard by all, but I am the middleman in the entire operation. So I was uh, sitting and then doing this job. And the rocket was in the horizontal position. I am the only person who has an access to it, in the sense, very close to the rocket. The blockhouse is supposed to be very safe. Uh, it has about some 12 feet thick concrete wall in case if something happens. So I was watching the rocket and then talking. It's going on. All of a sudden, I saw something funny. 
the rocket nose cone got ejected when it was in the horizontal position itself. I didn't understand uh, how the nose cone get ejected even before takeoff. So I said, all stations, this is control. The nose cone got ejected. <laughs> I, I could say only that. Immediately, the test director comes in the comes in the cell phone and then said, "Come on the internal telephone line." So I went to the internal telephone line. Then why you are telling this in public? I said, "This nose cone got ejected." Okay, uh, we are coming there. So they all came. And they found out that there was a stray current which had, we never defined the uh, ejection mechanism. It is actually, it, it fires a pressure cartridge. And that pressure cartridge is fired by uh, LMNR's cube, uh, lead mononitro resarcinate's cube. That cube, we never defined till that time what is a no fire current. We, we only say all fire current and stuff like that. So that was the first experiment. We, we failed. But it was, uh, it was talk of the town that instead of the nose cone getting ejected at an altitude, it got ejected right at the launch pad. Like that, people were talking about it, making fun of it, including me. Then what happened? Uh, we, we rectified it. We defined it, all fire current. And then we went ahead. The real flight was taking place. Next, another day. It's after about three months or four months. Again, the same controller's job. Control calling all stations. This is etc. All of a sudden, uh, some range safety fellow called, range safety calling controller. And I asked the controller, said, oh, go ahead. Range safety wants a hold. Uh, what for? We have some uh, suspected movement of fisherman boat on that area, so we want to clear it. OK. So as soon as then I asked, is it going to be a long time? We don't know. Then what do we do? We said, let's all go for external power. That is, the rocket should go to external power, meaning that the internal stored battery power is not exhausted. So I said, control calling all stations. Please go to external power. And then one of the scientist who was a project director for one of the payload, I was always talking to me. Whenever, when there is a free time, he will be talking to me. We will setting jokes and things like that. So he was interfering. I said, keep quiet. Then job is going on. Then I am asking the acknowledgment from all the project directors. Project director one, project director two, project director three. Then when it comes to project director four, this guy, I, I just gave the mic to him. He didn't know what the hell is that. He said, Roger. He also cleared it. He didn't even understand that we are asking him to go to external power. So it went on. After about two hours, everything is clear. So the payload safety, rain safety asked, we are clear, we can go ahead. So I'm telling the same thing. Again, the same Roger. I said, now you all can go to internal power. Please acknowledge. One, two, three, four. I gave it to him. He asked, what, do you, what are you saying? I said, you are now, you can come to internal power. When did we go to external power? <laughs> that was his first question. I said, Mr. So-and-so, please, because I have no way to discuss in the phone. After everything is over, I told him two hours back, you went on external power. He said, God. He said, Murti will eat me raw. And I'm not going to speak about it. Just let us continue. My battery must have already gone down dogs. I said, it is you who should decide. I am not the person. You tell me that it is Roger, it is Roger. Anyway, now to make a long story short, it went ahead. The flight was extremely successful. Every payload is working, excepting this payload. Now, this guy has a long face. We don't know. We have to see how. It, I said, what the hell? You don't know. You know very well that <laughs> this is because of your, um, this one. Now, I'm sharing this experiment with you purely to tell you 
how we were dealing with uh, such subjects in ISRO during those times, 1966-67 period. Similar incidents are there, many. But these are not actually recorded or not, uh, not discussed openly. But uh, of course, the most interesting part is the same payload ban created history by creating the same transponder. And it went on. And today, you have his transponders working left and right in all these areas. So this is one, one such incident where I, I thought I will just keep you informed. Another incident which I will uh, touch upon will be, today we are talking about Elon Musk is trying to use, uh, reuse the vehicles. I hope you, you must be keeping yourself uh, on that track. Or even we ourselves have done recently an experiment by which we were trying to recover the spent stage by parachute and the same thing come and came and hit the Bay of Bengal. Now, this incident which I am going to narrate took place 50 years back. We didn't have a rocket. We live alone to recover the rocket. We didn't have a rocket. But uh, this was Kalam's group. Kalam, myself, C.R. Satya, and then M.K. Abdul Majid, and V. Sudhakar. These are the five persons. We were sharing the table. Then Kalam said, hey, we should uh, recover uh, the rocket. Then we said, sir, we don't have a rocket. No, no, rocket will come later. But uh, today, we will assume that something is a rocket, then we will do it. So we created a canister kind of a thing. The rocket diameter is about some two, two feet long. And in that, we put uh, a dead weight. And then in the dead weight, we connected this to a parachute. Then that parachute put together, we connected to a float, a, a tube which is inflated. And then uh, put everything into the canister and uh, tied the whole thing with a cable. And we also loaded a cable cutter. That cable cutter can be used to cut the cable so that to release the payload, to release the parachute. Then we had an ejection mechanism which will hit the door of the canister. So we integrated the whole thing. It was a very interesting experiment. Then there was one pushback aircraft, the flying club aircraft. Uh, one group captain, uh, Krishna, he was requested that we are doing this experiment. So he was very happy. He came. So we took the payload, canister, with all those integrated, as I was telling you. And Sudhakar took the flight. Only two people can fly in that aircraft. So it went up. He dropped it. As it is dropped, a, a timer is initiated, and the time, timer hit the door after five seconds or seven seconds. That door got up, and then the entire thing came out. Then the cable cutter worked, and then the cable cutter released the parachute. And the parachute is bringing the entire payload descending down and touching the Arabian Sea. And as it touches, there was a color device we, we had. It, it is giving you a shining deep blue. And then the catamaran, we employed some fishermen to go and pick it up. Uh, the importance of this experiment is 50 years back, we never had a rocket. But Kalam had the vision of imagining a rocket and imagining a payload recovery and imagining the payload in such a manner and then drop it from the <laughs> aircraft. You see, this is where we used to think. But after 50 years, Today, we are doing experiments with a real rocket payload. And uh, even Elon Musk and this kind of people are doing it. But we were thinking about it 50 years back when we never had even a rocket, single rocket. <laughs> so when, when this has happened, we were very happy. We were uh, thinking about it. Then um, I, I think. 
Wait another incident. Um, I, I want to tell you where in the management students may probably apply their mind and then try to, if you can answer those questions, you can answer. Instead of yourself asking a question to me, I thought I will ask a question. Uh, when I was in France on an agreement, we were trying to acquire the technology of the Vikas engine. Otherwise, it is known as Viking engine. Now, that agreement was actually drafted by Mr. T. N. Session. And the session was at that time director of administration in ISRO. He's such a great person, he dictated the entire agreement in two, three hours. It was dictated in Bangalore office. And uh, I remember Datta Guru was the person who was typing that agreement. That there was a class which says, ISRO, Article 24, ISRO is free to use this technology for its own purposes. Very plain language. It says that ISRO is free to use this technology, that means the liquid technology, for its own purposes. It went through, I mean, it was vetted by ESA, it was vetted by European, all kinds of things, and it was vetted by the law department here. Everybody agreed, so the contract was signed, and we are there. Within two weeks after signing the agreement, after ourselves landing there, one Gibson came to the new head of ESA. Now, he was going through this agreement, and he found this class is disturbing to him. So he said, you should modify this class by saying, ISRO is free to use this technology for its, peace, its own peaceful purposes. He wanted to include the word peaceful purposes. So they called me. And then they said, uh, only two words we want to include, making it very light. I said, what are those two words? Peaceful purpose. I said, very fine. So what do you say? I said, no. It's very simple. You, your intention is only to use it for peaceful purposes. I said, yes. Our intention even now is to use it for peaceful purposes only. But why are you interfering into our freedom of thinking? You have agreed. You have signed the contract. You have signed the contract. You have to respect it. They said, if, we, if you do not agree to modify the contract, we will breach the contract. Fine. If we breach the contract, you will have to pay the compensation. We will pay the compensation. What is the reaction of the management cutter here to react back? This is a tussle, wherein the fellow wants to put Peaceful purposes should be included, and we say we will not include the peaceful purposes. Can anyone offer any solution to this or any comment? Or it can be vague, it can be. I hope the problem is clear, right? Am I clear in the problem, defining the problem? Yes or no? Is it clear? If it is clear, uh, at least a couple of people who are in the management cadre, if you can react to this, I'll be happy. In which I'll once again say that there is an agreement which was signed, duly signed by both the governments. And it is the duty of both the governments to respect the agreement. Now, one fellow says it has to be modified. The other fellow says, no, I don't agree to modify. Now, if there is no consensus, then the contract will be scratched. But at, while we say no, we also don't want the contract to be scratched. But at the same time, those fellows are very strong in telling, very, very strong. They say, if you are not willing to agree for this, we will call it off, and then we will scratch the contract, and we will pay you compensation. I think this is the problem. Somebody is there? Any? Don't take it as a very serious issue. You, you and you can say something different. It is immaterial. 
I'm sure you must have some ideas about it. Yes? I'm not able to hear you. You disagree. So what is the solution? Yeah, it's now on. The uh, compensation instead of being uh, abide to their rules. So you want to get the compensation? Yeah. But don't you think you lose the contract? So, but then it's better than being under their uh, control, right? Because uh, at least with the compensation, we might develop the technology on our own. Yeah, but then how do you get the technology? If you lose the contract, you lose the contract. The contract is lost. Anyway, your approach is correct. That is, you, you, you mean to say that there is no contract if this class is not there? Yeah, if I'm not able to like, use it freely according to my own will, then what's the point of the whole contract? The whole intention is lost, there, right? Yeah, this is a very good point. This is a way any youngster of your age, I was also telling the same thing. But the session did agree. Now, session said that we should do one more attempt to see how this can be rectified. So he was telling, OK, now I will tell you tell what session did. The credit you should go to session. Session said, all right, now you say that this, this should be modified, and we say that it cannot be modified. Let us do one thing. I will talk to the topmost persons in my country. In my country, I will get their reactions. And if they are agreeing to modify, we will modify. If they are not agreeing to modify, OK, that's it. So he told me in uh, local language saying that you come with me, don't speak anything, let us tackle it later. So we went out. We had our lunch. He was not speaking much. Then I said, what the hell is in your mind? Tell us. We just want to know. He said, we are not doing or we are not going to talk to anybody in the topmost country because this is difficult. Let us see how it works. Then we went back, and he started right from the beginning. He said that I talk to the topmost power in my country, which is not a true. And uh, they don't agree for this modification. But they wanted me to add that we have so many billion dollar worth of other contracts, including Airbus, this, that, the other. If you annul this contract, it will have its reflections in other contracts also. Got the point? He said, OK, that's all I have to say, so we are going. <laughs> Leaving them in lunch. What do you think the result could be? <laughs> they agreed not to insist on modifying the contract. They agreed, saying that <laughs> there is no need to. Now, what I, why I am giving you this uh, experiment, this uh, data, see the reactions of the contract negotiators, contract management people. This is purely a management question. And in the management, his uh, way to react instantly across the table, but of course, the uh, point I'm making is that uh, that's a crust of the problem is he's trying to threaten them that if you insist on this, then I will cancel all the other contracts. Whereas whether we are capable of con canceling all other contracts is a matter to be seen. May not be. But still, he did that very, very successfully. So this is one. One, exp one area where I'm just trying to say, not only the contribution of station, and um, we, we wanted to appreciate his presence of mind to save the contract. OK. Now let us move on a little bit more on the technology part of it. This will be probably useful for both management as well as uh, uh, the engineering community. Here, I just want to say, uh, I was not only really lucky to have such great people 
uh, let it be Kalam and Professor Sadish Dhawan. Uh, now they, they are not only just great, it is the greatest thing you can imagine. It is very difficult to have or to replace such people. Uh, absolute inch by inch, not only they are gentlemen, but uh, for example, this uh, Professor Dhawan is a Caltech post-graduation. Unimaginable, uh, very, and he is extremely good in his vocabulary and very charming. Um, I mean, I have no words to say. I, we, we, we love him. That's the kind of person. See, one day, uh, this Professor uh, Dhawan was, uh, but my, my luck was we were not getting the funding for the liquid projects. Because everybody was asking, where is the liquid? Liquid is only in Kaveri. And uh, so <laughs> where is liquid? We don't have the liquid. And in other words, put it bluntly, they didn't have the confidence level on the people who are telling that we will make liquids. And of course, we had problems on solids also at that time. But uh, they were not confident. So money was not coming through. But the lucky part is, all the three chairmen, it includes Professor uh, Vikram Sarabhai, Sadish Dhawan, and you are Rao. All the three chairmen are convinced, more than convinced, that it will come and it is a need of the country. But they are helpless. Very funny situation. They are the chairmen, and they, they are not able to move because they want to show the, here is the place where I can prove it to you that it will come through. And I am struggling to see that uh, something is being shown, nothing is being shown. We are talking about a 60 tonner, that is the Viking engine or the Vikas engine. We have the technology, but we are not able to show this is the engine, this is how it fires, this is how it is successful, etc. So in that process, we were struggling. So And the process was very simple. When we got some funding, the tune of some lakhs, I made a model. It, it is exactly one-to-one -one model. But the materials are different. Instead of KC20WN and HS25, all kinds of alloys, throw them to docks and then take uh, only mild steel and uh, various other materials, aluminum, etc. And that model was kept there. It is one-to-one -one model, look gigantic. I kept it in a place where it, it will not miss the eyes of anybody in VSSC, Vikram Saravai Space Center. It is in the foyer. So everybody who crosses this end, that end, will be seeing it. It can't miss their eyesight. I wrote there my biodata, a board. It's a tall fellow. My biodata. I am, my name is Vikas. I burned for 180 seconds. My thrust level is 60 ton. Like that, everything one by one. And the last line I wrote, but I am an orphan. It is kept there trying to work with the emotions of people. So I, it was my own design. <laughs> I kept it there because what else to do? You are asking money. The man who is capable of giving the money is not able to get the money. And you have no way of proving that you can do this unless, unless uh, you have an opportunity to prove it. So Professor Dhawan, who came, I told you about uh, such a great gentleman. He just like that walked through. He came back, looked at it, looked at the board. He again walked, he again came back and then said, what is that in the last line? You have said that you are an orphan. Yes, sir, I am an orphan. Speechless. He went and then showed his hand to follow him. Went to his room. He said, how much money you want? I said, sir, for the entire thing, large money is required. 
but uh, for making a working engine, we need one crore. Okay. At that time, one crore was a big money because we never had such kind of a budget. We can reappropriate if it is within certain limits. So he said, all right, I'll give you one crore. And you won't believe I have kept such a paper ready for him to sign. <laughs> because after he goes, if there is no, then he signed. He signed and then he wrote uh, to all the people, copy, etc., etc. Anyway, I managed. With that one crore, you have to get material for only one piece. You can't, you can't see, quantity, you have to go and order something more. But with that, we ordered. And sometimes, warrings and all, we ask somebody who comes from France to put in their pocket there are so many warrings and then bring it here. And uh, one bearing, like that, you know, that is the way we were. Finally, we got all the materials. We made one engine. And then Professor Davan asked, are you happy? I said, no. Now we have to test it, sir. Without testing, we can't prove that we have the liquid engine. For testing, I, I started, he said, don't ask me any more money. I said, no, sir, very small money is what is required. For test facility, we are not asking for hundreds of crores. That, if you want, you can give later. But if for testing, I need only one crore, one more crore. Anyway, he gave me that one more crore. We went abroad and then tested it. Supposed to burn for 140 seconds. I had an understanding with the test director. I said, still, I show my hand. Don't stop it. So I was waiting. After 140, that is the duration. I didn't raise my hand. The test director was asking, looking at me. I, I just closed my eyes. 140, 150, 160, 170. <laughs> it is going. And 180, that is the capacity of the tank. Beyond that, it can't go. So 180 seconds, and I mean, some of you, if you have watched the movie, you would have understood that uh, it was. With that success, see, without any such demonstration, I have been uh, threatening, I have been begging, I have been, all kinds of things were going on. But with this kind of a success, don't you think that I will not keep quiet anymore? So wherever I get an opportunity, I was trying to say that this is the best candidate for the PSLV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, this engine got a place in the PSLV. And then today, what you have is the, is the Vikas engines. But I'm narrating this incident to you only to impress you the path with which it has gone through. It was not an easy path. It was not your property. It was not uh, your house property. It is for public. And funds were not available because they didn't have confidence in you. Now, if you want to prove that you are capable, you need an opportunity. Opportunity was not given. So it's a very tricky situation. So we created that opportunity by using emotions, this, that, and the other. And I'm happy to say that uh, we, we could get through the See, these kind of things, the whole process, right from the inception till the first flight, it took 19 years. One nine. Hope you understand that. So today we are talking about it. Now everybody says, yeah, I know it already. It will come through. Yeah, it is a great thing. Vikas engineer. Of course, we have fired 59 times, including the first January flight, and not even a single failure for that engine. So I think uh, I, I, I have been assigned a certain time. I think that time is apparently, I don't know, it's over, I think. No? I think I was talking for about 40 minutes. 40 minutes. So now I, I will stop. There are so many incidents we can keep telling. It will be not only the aftermath of the liquid propulsion development, but also the sufferings of so many people. It is not just like that it came. It is uh, 
See, technological problem is different. It's the contract people say is only for the engine. Engine means gas generator, turbo pump, and the thrust chamber. But you have so many other things like fill and drain system, pressurization system, group organ decommand, and then uh, actuation system, tankages, structures. Nothing was there in the contract. All were developed by us. In fact, our di di diameters are different. Our tankages are different. Our thrust structures are different. So this is a long story. Some of them, we have revealed it in the book. Some of them, we have revealed it in the movie. And there are many more things which are yet to be revealed after some time. Because it should not uh, get into some embarrassment, some problem. But these are all truth. That, that is where we, we, we stand. Now I think I'll stop here with your permission. And maybe if you have any questions on whatever I said or anything else which is in your mind, I'll try to answer. If I know the answer, I will tell you. If I don't know the answer, I will say I don't know. Thank you very much, sir. Now, we will have a question and answer session. I request the students to introduce yourself first and ask your questions. I request you to keep it brief. Good morning, sir. I'm Gayatri from BTEC Mechatronics first semester. And your experience as a stalwart in the aerospace and science industry has been nothing but invaluable for young, budding students like us. So I have a small question, question for you. So considering the advancements in aerospace and aeronautical engineering, what key insights and recommendations do you have for young individuals like us aspiring to excel in this field? I'm not able to hear the last part of it. Uh, can, can you come to this side? Yes, sir. I guess she's on the Yeah, so the last part of my question was, here. Come to this side. You have a passage, no? I would be careful in answering the question. <laughs> yeah, tell me. So what are some of your key insights and recommendations for people who are aspiring to become aeronautical and aerospace engineers and scientists? That was the last part of my question, so. But I, I, I'll tell you the answer for this question is not a very simple answer. I mean, philosophically, we can say that something. But it is not applicable only to aerospace, but it is applicable to any field where you are working. It can be management, it can be aerospace, it can be you. you I am one who always advocates that don't ever work in a field which you don't like. If you don't like something, don't work on that field. You, you can never shine. So basic requirement is you should like the field. That is number one. Number two, once you like the field, make your focus absolutely clear. No matter what happens, you will achieve your goal. Till then, you are not going to sleep. This is what I did. So you can also do the same thing. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So you are studying aerospace? I aspire to study uh, aerospace and aeronautical engineering. No, you can, you can focus uh, your attention. See, I, I happen to be, it's a broad, spe broad spectrum. Mm -hmm. I happen to be the chemical rocket propulsion in the, then situations forced me to read combustion, which is a complicated subject. And then combustion, and then in which case it came to stability. So I was working on the stability theorem. Anyway, that is one, one part of it. And uh, the Professor Luigi Kroko, which I have shown in the movie, is an authority on the stability of uh, liquid rockets. In 1945 itself, he has written an agrograph, which is uh, even now not many people understand. But everybody uses the end result of it. So that way, he is a great person. So I happen to be his last student, incidentally. He was not willing to take any student anymore. Yeah, next. Can we have the next question? Okay. Hi, sir. My name is Yashin. I'm from uh, third sem mechatronics. So third year mechatronics. So my question is, so you have been in directing and heading many projects. So your decisions are crucial in some point. 
So in uh, current uh, youngsters, wavering mindset is a com a common for many youngsters. So what what's your thought on that, and how can we overcome that? You see, any any technology, <clears throat> if you know everything, then there is nothing for you to work. Since you don't know, you are trying to find out. You see, in our area, I'll tell you one very interesting example here. The unwritten law, unwritten law in our uh, aerospace parlance is that don't fly anything unless you test it on the ground in the same conditions. That is, you can't fly anything without testing the same in the ground. Now, we had, I was working on the second stage of the PSLV, GSLV, etc. Second stage has a nozzle. The nozzle is a bell-shaped nozzle, big nozzle. If I have to fly that nozzle, I have to test that entire engine under high altitude condition. Under high altitude condition means that I need to have a high altitude chamber. Now, the high altitude chamber would cost me something close to 100 crores. And to establish that will take another two, three years. Now, I knew it in the beginning itself. So people, whenever they were raised, but uh, my conviction was that I don't need to test it. Why I say that is that is an unwritten law. I want to break that law. This is my, my conviction. I, it is not supported by anybody. Anybody, including the project director of PSLV. Because I didn't go there and talk to them that I am not going to test it. Because if I started talking to them, then they will raise objections very heavily. So it was a strategy by which I kept quiet. Then one fine morning, I said that this is a problem. Now, if you want to test it, you need three years and 100 crores. So why not you do it without testing it? This discussion was now catching fire. Finally, the decision was, that was again my suggestion, we will fly only two stages not the entire vehicle. That flight you can consider as proving the high altitude condition of the second stage. Got the point? Got the point or not? Yes, sir. OK. Actually, you know, you have brought them to a level where they have no other choice. It is unfair in a way if you really look at it. But they agreed for that. And it was proved to be OK. And we saved 100 crores in three years. But the most important point here I want to communicate is that why I got convinced that it can be done. Because I have been seeing the high altitude chambers all over the world lying idle. Once you do it, afterwards, there is no need for that. So I was just thinking, why not we get rid of this? Second important point is I am fabricating the nozzle in the exact process of what others have done, like metal flowing and material is same, process is same, etc. So I had a feeling that technically I am clear that this can work. The only thing which I cannot communicate with them is that there is an unwritten law that no nothing can be flown without testing it. So your question was, what was your question? The wavering mindset, so for a decision. This was a wavering mind. I was myself, I, actually I was not wavering, but everybody else was wavering. But that wavering mind, you make use of it to your, in your favor. Supposing the question is, if you would have failed, supposing if the test is failed, as usual, I am going to be targeted. But why am I to worry about a thing which, according to me, can never happen? So as a techno manager of electronics, what you are doing, you should have no wavering in your mind. You should assess yourself whether this is the right route to go. If you say that this is the right route to go, then convincing others is a different question. But you must understand there will be always many people who will be advisors, who will say, one fellow will say no, one fellow will say yes, and they will watch the fund. So, so don't become the victim of such criticisms. So I hope you understand. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, can we have one last question? Last question. OK. 
okay so this will be the last question sir actually it's not a question it's a request how to my under shivering you want to ask but uh, how to say um i want your uh, blessings sir since it's my first uh, one time offer i have to make this you got uh, 400 million equipments for free for us but i want to ask this for you please i want some blessings from you sir for our natural blessings see my hands are shivering <laughs> can you give me that blessings sir blessings he is asking sir. for your blessings the very fact that i am here and talking to you very happily shows that i am not only blessing you no sir all the people i want i want to be like a natural blessing sir from your like come on okay but after that but i i think some of you might be under the wrong impression you could be shy in asking a question if i that is my reading i think please for heaven's sake don't feel shy to ask a question this is a closed door session i am appearing to be a stranger but i am not a stranger you can be free in asking even an idiotic question it doesn't make any difference but the point is unless you tune yourself to express your doubts express your matter then you will find it very difficult this is a forum where you can express yourself clearly it can be a wrong question so maybe they have announced that it is a last question that is actually it is not correct it is not a written law 1230 up to 1230 you said that you can go <laughs> so it is up to you but come on come on come on come on i was waiting for you to come so that i can continue to stop <laughs> after so. this we can have one more question <laughs> all the best take care yeah thank you thank you thank you take care you can become a legend too <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i actually you know in in my own opinion i am saying that many of you have bursting questions within you but you are not asking the question i am sure that most probably it is because of the fear that uh, whether somebody people will laugh at you and that kind of a thing but don't worry about it just let them laugh but you be the right person yes you are somebody else to ask a question yeah. sir namaskaram sir uh, i am supriya bore and sir it's a privilege to me for standing in front of you and have this one on one encounter and my question is the current generation is uh, you know rapidly changing so what kind of expectations you are having on the current generation young faces and uh, can you please throw some light on the management sector how can they contribute to the uh, country for the development <clears throat> again it is a, um, a philosophical question but i can tell you one thing the current, gen current generation is not bad they are good number one in fact they are here they are hesitant to ask questions that is a different matter but in other places they are not hesitant to ask questions they are asking questions they are enjoying a freedom in fact i can't ask my grandson or my granddaughter why they were late yesterday night they will say go on mind your business and why i am saying this the current generation is good but one thing i want to tell you see nothing will be equal to hard work no matter what it is today i am seeing I, I'm seeing the people at nine o'clock. They come, and then uh, evening five o'clock they go, and then that's all. But please understand, please understand. Whatever, if you consider, ISRO is a successful organization, which is true. It is because of the hard work. It is not because of anything else. There are days where we were sleeping on the beaches. there are days where we were sleeping on the tables put together there are days where we were not at all sleeping also but the point is today's generation do not understand that see that is where i said i will not talk about the shortfalls if i start talking about the shortfalls that will come as a first point why because you are question the younger generation is not willing to work hard 
that is not fair that is not correct also so i am saying nothing will replace your hard work you must work hard if you want results that's all i can say on this so would you like to take another question so okay so. yes sir not i want if there are people who want to another question no i am only trying to expose them uh, in the sense okay. let them come out of their fear let them come out of uh, if it is a true statement uh, hello sir i'm rohit and i'm from first year mba sir so my question is how do you manage to have calm and composure in difficult situations sir because nowadays uh, a youngster would just get anxious in just a span of seconds sir so how do you manage to have that calm and composure sir you have seen my movie yes sir that's the reason i wanted to ask you sir you have seen a... the experience i have gone through yes yes sir if you would have gone through that question if you have gone through a similar experience you wouldn't be asking this question I'm sorry. I just didn't mean it. I, oh. What I'm trying to say. Another question. Experience makes you calm, matured, and uh, free. Uh, hello, sir. Yes. My name is Varsha. I uh, my question was. Uh, mic. Is it audible? Oh. Yeah. Use your mic. Okay. <laughs> my name is Varsha, and my question was. Uh, in the workplace sometimes we are very passionate about our work but external factors affect our decision making uh, when we are working and we'll have to go against a certain beliefs and ethics of our own and we may lose uh, a certain things so how do we maintain ourselves or is it good that we get out of our ethics or borders that we have maintained for ourselves I uh, am not quite sure about uh, your uh, whether I have understood your question properly. I, my attention was I was thinking something else. Sure. So can you please repeat the question? Sir, uh, so suppose uh, in our workplace there are times wherein we'll have to function according to others' wants and needs, and we may have our own uh, barriers and beliefs that we need to follow, like to maintain ourselves. So is it good that we break our uh, you know ethics or some other form of things to serve people and make the workplace a better experience is it good to do that or should we maintain our barriers I answer that question with an ex with a small explanation you all know that there is a vikas engine and that the vikas engine is a work hard engine and it is working well now if you club four such vikas engines it will give you a thrust of 240 tons thrust uh, it was my dream that we should cluster this what do you mean by cluster is joining together so that you have a thruster with 240 tons then we will be sky is the limit we can talk about everything now i am struggling even to get one engine tested at the same time i am dreaming a four engine should be clustered and do you think i will have the courage to go and say this to people i was in confused but the person mr professor davan who was supporting my approach he has agreed for a single engine test stand that is to test 60 ton that 60 ton has four legs and this four legs are 4 meter apart supposing if you keep that as 5 meter apart then you can accommodate the four engine cluster also the cost difference will be approximately 1 crore during that time i didn't have the guts to tell this to professor davan so i told your question somebody else's influence comes there they i told mr john who was the construction engineer saying that sir please keep this as 5 meter by 5 meter he said it will to cost you additional money i said it will cost additional money i will manage to give you that money by some reappropriation but let it be a very 
He said, if you say so, I will do it. Matter ended there. That is, I didn't obey others. I didn't even tell others. I have executed what I wanted. But it is illegal. It is not acceptable. I thought nobody will notice it, it will go. It was my short-sightedness. One of these days, when Professor Davan landed in Trivandrum, his flight to Bangalore was cancelled due to some bad weather or something. So he was asking, why, what do I do for the rest of the day? Why not we go to Mahendragiri where this uh, construction work is going on? I was not very happy, but uh, we took him there. And he's such a sharp person, from a long distance, he, he observed, he asked me, hey, that's supposed to be four meters, but it looks like it is more than four meters. What, is, what will be your answer? Will you say yes? Will you say no? I was trying to contain myself. Then John said, hey, sir, it is five meters. We have kept five meters as requested by Nambi Narayana. <laughs> then the next question Professor Davan asked, which was hurting me like anything, is that, are you the chairman Isro, am I the chairman Isro? I lost all my composure. I said, sir, undoubtedly you are the chairman Isro. Mm -hmm. We will go ahead with the four meter and etc. Mm -hmm. etc. Et and we went ahead, four meter. Matt is done. One engine testing, everything is going on. Years pass by. Another seven or eight years gone, Professor Davan retires. Professor so Yuar Rao took over. We are talking about a GSLV's advanced configuration wherein everybody feels that a four engine of this configuration, if it is there, then uh, it would have been easy. And cost-wise, it will be cost-effective. Then they were saying, hey, why we didn't construct the test facility for four engine? Somebody should have told that at that time. Somebody should have visualized it at that time, etc., etc. I was keeping quiet. Because what do I say? I just kept quiet. Then Professor Rao, um, it, uh, Professor Davan was sitting in the meeting. Professor Rao asked the question, hey, Nambi, you, you normally would have thought about it. Why you didn't? Uh, again, I was keeping quiet. Because it was unfair that I should not talk about it. To my surprise, Professor Davan raised his hand and then said, you are all barking on the wrong tree. It is me who stopped that four engine configuration. You see, the finest gentleman, he accepts the blame. He also takes the blame on him. And he is protecting my interest. And he is telling that I have made a mistake. This is where I say he is a great man. So to answer your question, you always need not respect others' views. but. Try to understand that you should escape from there if you can. If you can't, then surrender to their questions. You have no choice other than that. Done. Okay, yes. so we are, we, we are done with the Q&A session. No, some two people are raising their hands. <laughs> I'm happy because 12.30 okay. and the 10 minutes are okay. there. Okay. Hello. 12.30 you said. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, one more question, please. Good afternoon, sir. This is Ayush Kumar from MBA. So actually, I don't have a technical question right now, but my question would be helping a lot of people here. So what would be that worst life lesson you have been taught by your lives and experience to address all the uh, youth every present here? What would be your? One life lesson you would like to address everyone present here. So, so learning from your life is asking to the youths of India. No, sir, I am not able to hear the properly. Maybe I have some. So, what would be the one life lesson you have been taught by your life, your experiences, your incidents? You would like to address. Yeah, actually, with? my my mission or a vision was not uh, not a small. It was a big <laughs> big mission. But uh, what happened, um, see, we needed higher capability to carry higher payloads. It was true long back. It is true even today. Now, once you have the higher capability, then you can achieve not only Chandrayaans, Mangalyaans, 
and moreover, you know, Venus or any, that is one route of it. And you can also have the Kaganyan kind of a project. You can have space stations, you can write tourism, and so on and so forth. Interplanetary travel. My mission was, my mission was, you have NASA for the Americans. You have ESA for the Europeans, European Space Agency. My vision was that we should have an ESA, Asian Space Agency, for all the countries we are talking about, India, Vietnam, Bangladesh, um, uh, Malay Islands, Sri Lanka, Korea, and then talk about Gulf countries, including Japan, excepting China and Pakistan. <laughs> I am not going to exclude them, but if they are willing, they are quite happy to join us. That is a different question. So I want to have an ESA. I will tell you, even today, I don't know, but many people have not thinking about it. These are the three organizations which are going to fulfill mankind's long-standing mission of interplanetary travel. You can't do it. You see, what happened to America? He had sent so many people to the moon. Today, why is he keeping quiet, leaving everything to Elon Musk? Talk about ESA, what are they doing? So I am saying that is all because of money. Money is required. Without money, nothing can move. Now, supposing if you have an ESA, for example, take ourselves. You have so many people, uh, including Gulf, they will, they will come and join you. They will also bring in money. Now, you can do so many things. Whatever we are talking about it, if you have, see, what is holding you from achieving certain things, if you honestly answer me? Is it because you are not having intelligence? You are not having capability? You are not understanding the complexity of space? No. It is because you don't have that kind of a money. That is all, simple. So if you have the money, you can... See, most of NASA's workers are Indians. So we are proud to say that we have the capability. But money is required. We are trying to take shortcuts everywhere. Not for any credit. I was trying to avoid testing the fourth stage because I wanted to save 100 crores. Point is that you are taking all these risks because you don't have that kind of a money. Now I am saying that if you have these the three, Sorry. then you will be able to achieve what you want. And we can, ESA can certainly do many things. And, uh, and uh, so that is, that is what we are talking about. So my, you asked me my life vision. I only wish that this ESA comes into existence and we are able to proceed further. I think I'm sorry. You see, I was only trying to stimulate you to make you to ask questions, not because that I want to answer the questions, but because I want you to ask the questions. Yes. I am happy that at least after I have told, at least some four or five people have come who are otherwise not willing to come forward. And your questions are valid. The way you didn't ask these questions is my question. But anyway, nice talking to you all. So, yes. uh, so you want to conclude it as get rich, be rich, and die rich. That's it. Uh, what is it? So you like to conclude it like be rich, get rich, and die rich. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank no, you, No, no. Okay, okay. I'll follow till my last breath only. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Somebody. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's uh, done. It was indeed a great session, sir. Thank you, thank you so much for giving us such informative and enlightening insights about your life, your journey, and your teachings. Thank you, sir. Yeah, now it is 12.30 is the scheduled time, and he has also given me the 60 minutes uh, target. I'm happy that I was able to communicate with you. At least I'm able to hear and see some smiling faces, not with the view that when this will be <laughs> over, that kind of a thing is not there. So you guys are actually liking it. So I'm very happy for having talked to you. And uh, take care of yourself. Wish you all the best and a happy new year. And uh, nice talking to you. Thank you, sir. First of all, I would like to thank Chancellor Dr. P. Shamaraju for supporting and providing such an informative Doin lecture series. It gives me great pleasure to thank today's chief guest, Sri Nambi Narayanan S. for making time between his hectic schedule and sharing a lot of valuable insights. Thank you, sir.
Last but not least, I would wholeheartedly thank all the faculty members and students for your cooperation and active participation throughout the session. Thank you all.